So it's April 9th, 10 days before town's impending close down for all intents and purposes. My editors come into my office with my art director, Paul Dalkian, and they say, Amir, we have a great idea for a cover story. It's going to be called The Death of the Brokerages and we're gonna have uh, two feet on a morgue slab uh, because of all the disruptions and changes that are happening to the residential brokerage. And I say, it's a great idea, let's do it, and we move forward with it. And um, 10 days later, town shuts down operations, and the only thing we change to the cover is add town's toe tag to the illustration. This was sort of what was to come. And I guess the question is, how does a firm the size of town. At its peak, it had 600 brokers. Over the course of eight years, they did $13.5 billion in transactions, $380 million in gross commissions, multiple offices. How does a firm at that scale, right, how does a firm like that just close overnight? So I'm very pleased to have Town's founder and CEO, Andrew Heiberger, joining us today to discuss what's, what happened. Thank you. All right. Okay. Andrew, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you. I, the first thing I want to ask you is, um, is it's, April 19th, right? You're about to announce to everybody. I mean, the rumors are flying. I got brokerage heads calling me and they're telling me that managers from town and brokers from town are calling them and saying, things are coming to an end. Can you take me? What's going through your head on April 19th before you're publicly gonna announce that town, eight years, your baby, what's going through your head when you are about to make that announcement? Um, what was going through my head at that time was that uh, the company business model uh, was not sustainable and um, the business model as I drafted it uh, in 2010 um, did not stand a chance of making sustained profits and um, there were a number of different um, factors uh, that led me to the final final conclusion but what was most important is when I came to that conclusion, I took immediate action. Um, I believe that as the head of a brokerage firm and as a fiduciary to um, 500 plus um, uh, li licensed representatives as well as $600 million of exclusives, that if I'm gonna close down the rental and sale operation of town, that it was important that it was handled uh, swiftly. And when did you first see the writing on the wall? When did you first say, like, this is not going to work out? You put a lot of your own money into it. Uh, at what point were you like, this is it? Um, the night before, um, I received um, financial reports um, that the uh, first quarter um, was going to be way off uh, in projections. And um, what the final numbers were going to be way off and that the second quarter and pipeline was going to be way off from way off, and that the third quarter and fourth quarter um, was going to be dismal. This was not your first rodeo. You founded City Habitats. You sold it after 10 years for mm -hmm. 50 million to Rheology and NRT. Uh, you, you, you say that this literally happened overnight, right? The night before you saw the numbers. Why not give it a, you know, why not give it some time and, uh, you know, see if you can make it work. I mean, you've done this before. You've been doing it for eight years. Anyone uh, who knows me uh, in, on a professional level or a personal level, uh, including you, uh, knows that I did give it my all. Um, and they know that I've worked seven days a week and 18 hours a day um, since town uh, was created and then uh, since town's launch and all through um, all the ups and downs uh, that town, uh, the, the town experience from the beginning to the end. And um, I, uh, it, it became clear to me with um, the costs of recruiting, the costs of retention, the number of defections from the company, and the decisions that I was forced to make um, to terminate key staff, um, and, and in some instances friends, um, uh, along with the fact that the managers of my offices uh, could not assure me 
that revenues were going to increase. Um, they could not give me any clear indication um, that the business model was going to work to, towards a profit. And, um, and they also um, informed me that they could not operate for lesser salaries, that they could not operate with lesser support staff, and that they needed everything to remain the same in order to retain uh, their teams and to produce. So, so you had a situation where you go to your managers and your staff and you're like, guys, it's not looking good. You're not giving me any good news. Uh, I need to cut down your staff. I need to cut down salaries in order to make this work. And, uh, and they, you couldn't get your managers to agree with you. Um, I did do that. Um, I did do that individually, one-on-one. -on -one. I have a more of a one-on-one -on -one management style than I do uh, a group meeting management style. Um, because of the nature of this industry and the nature of business in general and the speed of social media and the lack of uh, confidentiality. Um, but I did, during the prior year, um, over the summer, uh, was, was very closely monitoring um, all the different revenue uh, classes at town. Um, there's luxury sales, luxury rentals, new development sales, new development rentals, and commercial. Um, I get reports weekly and monthly, um, and we revisit the, uh, the budget and the forecast uh, regularly. And I did make decisions to uh, cut back on salaries and even to close office locations that were not profitable, um, which included the two Brooklyn offices and the Queen's office first, um, and the salaries that went along with it. Well, I want to come back to what you think about the Arab uh, offices, but uh, who are the first people you notified when uh, you were going to make the decision to close down? Um, my wife and my ex-wife. <laughs> <laughs> Honey, things are going to be tight next month, right? Uh, that's good. <laughs> What were, like, you know, it's a big decision for you. This was your baby. You, you managed to do something that a lot of brokers and brokerages who are much older than you and had a lot more money than you uh, still, uh, still to this day uh, didn't achieve, haven't achieved. Um, did you have any options? Like, you know, this was an important thing. You had a lot of people looking to you for their uh, work and salaries. Did you ha what were the options available to you at that point? Were, could you merge with anybody? Did you go reach out to anybody to sell? Were you looking for other investors? What were the, was the, this, was, this must have been your last option. So um, it was definitely the last option and, um, and really the only option because um, for me to sell town to somebody else, knowing what I know about the existing business model and how the existing business model is not profitable is me selling a not profitable business to somebody else. Um, and in the beginning, when I launched the company and it had stratospheric positive results and attracted 600 people and I think we got to 10 offices or so and we got an offer of $119 million from the number one company in the entire world um, for, uh, based on a 60% value. Uh, you, you got a $119 million offer. We got a $119 million written offer. Um, it was the valuation, uh, but it was, to, it was to buy 60% of the company and to keep me in the business uh, for another 40% for seven years, um, so. Um, that, that sounds like a good deal. I mean, it was, wh what, why not take that deal? Um, you're gonna have to ask somebody else that question. Well, I mean, you're the CEO of the company, you founded the company, why not ask you? You're gonna have to ask someone else that question. Does anyone have Joe Sitt's number? <laughs> we'll, we'll give him a call, find out why he didn't take that deal. Um, all right, so what, what was the hardest part about making that decision, ultimately? About not taking the 119 million. No, about about shutting down, uh, shutting down. Don't. So after after uh, 2013, we got the company to near profits, but it wasn't at profits. But what I learned is that um, brokerage companies and any business um, can trade at a valuation and not their value, not based on revenue, not based on income, but based on projected income, based on valuations. Um, based on their story they're going to tell and how much supposed market share they're going to capture. 
And that, in fact, the business story there is that that's the best time, really, if you want to um, capture the most equity and take the least risk as an entrepreneur of a startup business, that's really the best time to sell. When there's still three to four years left for your concept to prove out, but you're enough in to prove that the concept is working. So I had no reason to believe that my business plan that I wrote myself in March of 2010 um, and that um, I hired people with my own money, uh, some of which I saw here earlier tonight. I think I saw Chris Reyes was the first person who went on payroll for this uh, venture. Um, and we had people on payroll all year and they were adding to my business plan um, to make it great. And then I opened for business on December 9th and we operated and <clears throat> we had great success. Um, and we fought hard to elbow our way in to a very, very crowded, old guard, traditional brokerage industry. Um, and, and we did quite well, and then we got that offer. Um, the decision was made not to take that offer. Um, there was a couple of other um, <clears throat> uh, uh, vastly publicized um, uh, event, events and happenings at town in 2015 and 16, which everyone here is aware of. And, uh, and, and then in 2016, being that um, I'm the kind of person that finishes what he starts and I don't quit and I hung in there for six years um, to finally gain full control of my company back and full ownership of my company, I put my head back down the next day and I went back in to try to get it back to where it was. And I was having great success. Um, I've eliminated uh, a $10 million loss and got it down to like a $687,000 loss in 2017. But at the same time, the revenues were declining. And, um, and the market, just in that short period of time, changed so much. Um, Street Easy flipped on the brokers and became their competitor. Um, uh, there was a whole little thing, you know, within Rebney where there was a lack of alignment um, at the RLS um, that, you know, that, um, you know, people, uh, brokerage firms were, were looking out for their best interests and not for maybe the greater good of the industry. Um, and there were um, VC-backed uh, firms, um, I'm going to not name anybody on stage, um, that raised hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, to uh, recruit um, and uh, to recruit um, and to build a, a new platform that's tech enabled. Well, let's talk about recruiting. I mean, in a lot of ways, uh, when you first started town, you scaled ex incredibly fast, which meant you had to recruit, mm -hmm. you know, bunches, you know, groups of people at a, at a time. And uh, you sort of changed the trend for brokerages where you came in and you would take entire teams, you would take eight, seven people from different firms. Do you feel like you had something to do with that whole trend of people coming and poaching? And you, there was, you know, rumors that you also changed the way that you hired people, like offering them different commission splits and things like that. So, um, <clears throat> I don't really like the word poaching uh, versus, I don't like the word poaching versus the word recruiting. Um, I do think that recruiting is fair play uh, in the game, and I do think that the real estate brokers and all of you out there that are real estate brokers deserve to have opportunities presented to them and hopefully get better offers elsewhere and hopefully your careers advance. In fact, that was one of my mantras when I set out with town. Um, I noticed that the, the big companies, the behemoths, uh, namely the two top firms were having their way with the brokers. They were charging technology fees, and they were charging you know, uh, other types of, uh, of, of uh, fees and expenses that should not have been charged, and they also had the commission split maximum stuck at 70%. Um, I used the exact same uh, commission scale for my initial hiring, because I didn't want to be perceived as a discount broker or a rental broker or all the, way, all the different ways that I was going to possibly be positioned. I anticipated that. And, um, and we hired on the same commission scale as an average of Douglas Elliman, Brown Harris Stevens, and the Corcoran Group. So I utilized the traditional brokerage model commission splits. The only exception to that, I believe the only exception, I hope somebody doesn't jump out and say that's not true, is, um, <clears throat> is if we gave a 5% uh, transition bonus 
sometimes to people because in transitioning from one firm to another, there's always going to be a lull and a loss of business. Um, and then also we did loss makeups to, uh, with some people. Um, other brokers were asking for guarantees of listings. And uh, for a very short period of time, there were some guarantees of listings offered to certain brokers to come. Um, but that was a practice that I immediately denounced and that we stopped because it's not sustainable. And another large firm, a very large firm, um, uh, created a whole hiring and poaching or recruiting campaign based on offering new developments and assignments on new developments um, you know, to join their well, firm. I mean, some of this stuff that I'm seeing now, uh, you know, offering uh, top brokers, they're 100% of their first six, six deals. Mm -hmm. Now it's gone up. It's like Miami and uh, California now where they're offering 80, 90% splits, right? Mm -hmm. And bonuses. And you're saying that's not sustainable. So what does that mean for the companies that are offering uh, deals like that? Right. So to be clear, um, I'm not here to speak to you or anyone else that cares to listen to what I have to say now or in the future um, to say that the brokerage business is dead. Um, and I'm not even saying that the traditional uh, broker or agent that works at the traditional bro brokerage firm, you know, should be leaving uh, town, no pun intended. Um, but um, what I am saying is that to be the owner of a traditional brokerage firm, small or large, um, that has all of the services that a traditional brokerage firm offers, which I can get into, um, cannot make sustained profits based on the current commission scales and based on the current commission splits and based on the rents and based on the salaries that need to be paid to support so, that business. So what does that say for? The rental and sales side, new development's different. So what does that say about the companies that do offer that stuff? I mean, uh, your average rent was around $45 uh, per square foot for your offices, correct? Yeah, so, the, um, so another, another fact that um, needs to be straightened out um, here is that um, I paid and pay the lowest price per square foot for luxury office space of any of the top 10 um, luxury competitors. Um, I know for a fact, and uh, you know, I, I've gotten some great lease deals um, on my spaces. I pay $57 per square foot uh, or, for, or so for 110 Fifth Avenue when somebody who's right next door, you know, 10 numbers less, um, is paying $90 per square foot. And now that uh, teams are becoming so huge um, and they take up so much square footage, um, there used to be a rule of thumb in commercial that the average body in, a, in an office takes up 200 to 250 square feet. And that includes all the common areas and the boardrooms and the restrooms and the, and the loss factor. Um, and I think with brokerage firms and even other concepts, like the WeWork concept, you can get away with maybe saying it's 100 to 150 dollars, 100 to 150 square feet. But if you have a 10 person team, occupying 1,200 square feet of your office, just the rent cost alone to have that 12-person team there every single day is 12 times $90. I believe that comes out to be $108,000 per year just to let that team um, have uh, use your facilities. It's really important to get the maximum amount from every person that's in your office. Uh, speaking of spending, uh, there's, there's this perception out there that when you started, you know, it, it was a big flash tons of advertising, tons of branding, uh -huh. amazing parties for a thousand parties. people. And uh, there was this, you know, there was this assertion that you spend a ton of money on. Tons, tons of money. <laughs> so yeah. what do you have to say about that? Is, is that accurate? Uh -huh. um, I, I did have an annual holiday event, um, like, like I've always done for uh, 20 years prior. And I started that uh, tradition again with town. Um, there's only a few venues um, in the city that hold uh, 600 agents plus clients plus customers uh, and in some instances spouses and significant others. And uh, those venues are uh, Cipriani, uh, Tau, um, and a few others. It depends on which ones you pick. There's not a lot. And um, what I can tell you is that I'm personally friends with the strategic group. And um, we never spent more than $125,000 on our annual holiday event. And uh, the total cost of our entire holiday uh, event uh, expense um, is a lot less than having four front row seats at the Nick game.
uh, look, when you, when you first started, there was, um, you know, you obviously you had amazing momentum when you first started. Things were going really well. And something along the way obviously didn't pan out, right? If you could go back and do something differently or take a different approach to something, what would that be? Uh, I honestly have to say that, um, that I wouldn't do anything differently uh, than I already did. Um, I think that I accomplished what I set out to do, that I built the, the business according to the business plan that I carefully curated and wrote um, and got input along the way uh, from others uh, after the initial plan was written. But, but something obviously didn't and pan out. I got, and I did get a bona fide offer for a ton of money uh, if I was looking at the equity as my end result. Um, what didn't pan out is that as I sit here today, that um, town residential as we knew it, town residential as we knew it, um, being a traditional brokerage model, rental and sale business can, can no longer exist. Being a traditional rental and sale business can no longer exist. Um, and um, we've been disrupted. So, um, and there's a lot of reasons why I feel we've been disrupted and uh, I, even though I feel alone on this stage, I don't feel alone. Mm -hmm. And um, look, um, that it's tough to put it this way, but if you were uh, Pam uh, Liebman or Howard Lorber right now, right. what would you be concerned about? Um, I think Pam's in Barbados right now with her entire team, isn't she? That has to cost more than 120. How much does that cost to go? <laughs> um, hi, Pam. Um, so, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> if you were Pam Liebman or Howard Lorber, uh, what would you be concerned about today, seeing what happened to you? Um, well, just seeing what's happened. Um, <laughs> I don't take it personal. Uh, the the um, what I'd be concerned about is the same things I was concerned about on April 18th and April 17th and last summer and last fall. Um, I'd be concerned that um, the, uh, the commission splits um, are going to continue to rise, that the competition is not going away, um, that um, the, um, the uh, costs of rent are not going down, um, and that the salary expenses are, uh, are a big concern as well. Because um, even though the um, town had, was, some, some claimed the town was top heavy and had a lot of high paid uh, senior executives. And you, you might want to argue as a Monday morning quarterback, considering that it's Monday afternoon, um, that that might be a little, bit, a little bit true, but when you're in a business that's growth oriented, um, I think it's important for you to have reliable people that you could leave behind in the room with your top agents and your clients and your customers and your developers. But e even if that were so, the lion's share of the work that's being done uh, at these companies through the admins and, and the tech support um, you know, are people that earn less than $100,000. And that market right now uh, has never been more robust um, in New York City than, than it is right now. It is very, very, uh, it seems like it is very, very easy for someone who's ca capable and competent to get a new position in that, in that price category. So you just think admin stuff and just regular well, staff, so, the prices so for that is going to So on up. the expense sheet, the fixed expenses, well, the, the number one expense is, um, is, is the cost of goods sold, and that's your, your agent commissions payable. So you have your, 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 your commission comes in, then there's either a referral fee, which by the way is a big issue now with lead generation, now has inserted themselves as a middleman into referral leads. So there's referral fees that have to be paid either to City Realty or other co-brokers or other lead sources or co-brokes to other firms. Then you have the agent uh, gets their split, which has never been higher. So that's great news for everybody in this room. Um, that's that's a, in a broker. And then after they're paid, you have what's called the house net. And the house net should be operating, it used to be 62% back in the days of city habitats. Um, it's at town, it was around 68%, which is still considered a very, very good, healthy house net. And um, on April 19th, my house net was getting up towards 74% 
going forward. And the reason it was tilted so high, because a lot of, I see a lot of brokers in this room that were not on 74% splits with me, so they're like, well, how is the average at 74%? Well, the answer to your question is, is that there were about 10% of the people uh, in our firm doing the lion's share of the business um, in this market, in this new challenging market, and they are at um, very high splits, and they also head teams. Uh, you know, when premium agent first came, when Street Easy first came on the market, it was the broker's friend, it was the consumer's friend, and it worked out great. And then the premium agent came, and it sort of disrupted things. And then the brokerage community came together and said, you know what, we're not going to allow this to happen. But then at the same time, uh, two of the biggest brokers, brokerages, uh, did you know sort of backroom deals. You know these guys. Between the two of them, they have 70% of the market uh, for new developments and a large part of the resales. Do you feel that they sort of shot themselves in the foot and for the rest of the industry by doing that? Um, I don't know the. Uh, I know the traditional brokerage model. I think as good as, as they do, and as good as anyone else that's sitting in here, or anyone else, period. And um, I don't know what their deals were. I mean, if, if Element's deal is, is that we get a first look you know, at every uh, four to $10 million buyer first, and the, the house gets it, and then they can refer it out to their top brokers at a 50-50 house referral, which is significantly less than the 66% uh, house net that it should be, or 74%, which is not sustainable, um, then I guess that he made a very, very good deal. Um, if his deal was that we're gonna do this deal with you now, and also we're gonna fund you know, a merger where we're gonna become the broker, uh, the local broker in you know, the markets that we're in for uh, Wall Street Easy Leads, if you need a broker, click here, and it's only Element, then he made a great deal. Um, you know, in, in Pam's sense, you know, uh, if, you know, she has a lot of other, uh, a lot of other entities to be concerned with when she makes, you know, local decisions. Um, it's supposed to be separation of church and state, but um, the Corcoran Group is part of a huge conglomerate called Realogy, and Realogy has a lot of other concerns nationwide, and Realogy has to be concerned with Zillow nationwide, and they gotta be con concerned with this new platform in the Hamptons called Out East which is the uh, new reincarnation of HREO, and uh, there's a lot of other concerns there, so. I mean, regardless, they broke from the group and decided to do their own deals. Uh, I mean, that's gonna have an impact on the, obviously it already has a huge impact on the brokerage business now, so. Right, well, it's not a big surprise, and um, it's been that way uh, since I've been in the business. Um, it's been that way since I've been in the business. Uh, is there any scenario you see where, uh, you know, listing service like Street Easy, uh, you envision something like that uh, actually being a friend to the brokerage community? Well, a friend. Um, so, it, you, know, you have to admit it's a, it's a, good, it's a good website. Um, it's easy to use, it's simple, um, it's extremely well known. Um, it's, you know, relatively pretty accurate. And um, so it already is a friend. Um, in fact, at one point for cutting expenses, I was actually considering, well, I'm just gonna have no IT department, just tell everyone to go on Street Easy. Um, if it's a relationship business, we'll help you be a buy side agent. Uh, and you, know, you could just use Street Easy and we don't need any of the, any of the other platforms um, to, to exchange and share information. And, and that's what we're gonna offer here. Um, but what does that mean for the brokers and agents in the audience? Because, well, I mean, on, these on guys the, have to hang their licenses somewhere, right? So it still has to be brokerages and firms. Well, so brokerage firms or, bro or, or yeah, so brokerage I mean, firms. Well, the agents have to hang their licenses somewhere, right? right so. so the brokerage firm model that seems to be, um, you know, for now and in two years from now, the, the, the tech might even change much more rapidly and maybe a real tech player like an Amazon uh, or you know uh, you know or you know an eBay or some or Facebook might enter the real estate space, and if that happens, then um, then that's a whole different story. Mm -hmm. But um, the the um, the brokerage models of the future, I think, need to be more a la carte. And I think that you, uh, as the broker, I think that you uh, need to get maybe even higher splits, but you need to pay for what you use and not pay for what you don't use. 
and maybe there could even be a little WeWork component woven into it where, you know, you, if you're a virtual, you pay for, you know, access to the office and conference room facilities, and if you're, you know, uh, a team, you pay for how much space you, you, you take up, and, uh, and for branding and marketing services, you pay for branding and marketing services. Um, you basically become their landlord as a, bro as a oh, brokerage. You mean, you mean if you're going to own the traditional brokerage? Yeah. Um, Basically, I mean, I, I don't, I, I don't think that, um, I don't think that the traditional brokerage model is sustainable. In terms of commission splits, uh, do you foresee New York being in line with uh, Florida and California? Is that, is that next on the horizon? I don't know exactly um, from experience. I and, and I should. Uh, I know a lot more about Miami and Florida than I do about California. It's, it's uh, roughly the same thing. You know, and, ninety percent, eighty percent splits. Right. So, the way that smaller firms, even in New York, um, survive that have the traditional brokerage uh, appeal um, is that, and what's common is that the, they're either they're owned by a group of partners, there's one firm I'm thinking of that's owned, a really good firm, that's owned by a group of partners, and the partners do, real, do deals themselves. They, they, do, they do sales themselves, they handle new developments themselves. Um, there's another nice firm that's been around, you know, they say for 100 plus years, we have to verify that. Um, and I know that, I know that the, uh, the CEO of that firm does transactions uh, their self as well. And uh, so I think smaller firms where the broke, where the where the house um, uses the income from um, having uh, associate brokers or associate agents um, as uh, an accessory to their business plan, I think that those could you know be sustainable um, because because I do think that you know good advice is um, you know is uh, is still in command. Uh, De what, demand. Uh, what's going to happen to a lot of rental brokerages. You know, right now you see landlords uploading their properties directly to StreetEasy and other listing services. Uh, is there going to be a need for a rental brokerage? So, um, the, the you saw this on your end. And you saw that number decline. Uh, yeah, seriously, right? almost disappear. Yeah. Um, uh, almost disappear. My end. My end almost disappeared. Um, so that's what this is all about. This is about my end. Um, so, um, I mean, look, the, 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 for a long time now, and it's been unspoken, so let it be spoken, you know, the, the commission fee charged for a, you know, a direct deal or a non-co-broke deal is a one-month fee. Um, one-month fee now is pretty much where... So it's not the standard 15% that it used So to. that's changed from when I came into the business in 2010 to now. Um, I, I used to average around 13.5% or so. Um, and for the most part, the new fee is, is kind of one month. And it's, it's a little bit difficult for you to tell a landlord of a property that, you know, he, he or she should sit with their vacant apartment for three, four, five months, and then you're going to take almost a two-month fee on the transaction. And it's become more common now that some of the elite brokers, um, you know, look at it more as of a service to the, the owners of the condos. Uh, the, unit, the condo unit owners to keep contact with the, with the unit owners and sometimes even waive the fee altogether um, so that they could um, you know, keep, keep in good standing when they do want to sell it to try to get their portion of the 5 or 6% commission. Um, the multifamily landlords, the ones that are in that business, um, all have the capability of posting listings now directly on StreetEasy. Um, and they, they could in, install a top salesperson, whether it be a family member of theirs or, um, you know, one of, one, of, one of the agents that wants to be, you know, a rental, uh, you know, uh, almost like a property management function, a shower that has so good Rather than pay a percentage, they just pay a salary to someone to be there and just... They, they could just pay a salary or they could just pay them uh, the one month fee, whatever, whatever it might be. But it's, it cuts out one half of the transaction. There is not the tenant side and the buy side. And now you're seeing that happen the with tenant the tenant side and the sell side. For new developments too, like, you know, they're coming up with their own sort of brokerages because they think there's so much savings to be had yep. by doing it in-house. Where, where, where did you see those examples? Well, one last thing with the landlords. I know that Rebney, um, I know the Rebney landlords, um, I, I, w I was sitting on two boards at Rebney. One was the residential board with, with the brokerage heads. 
um, which after April 19th I resigned from, um, I was invited to stay, um, just, just for the record. Here, put it over here so they can hear you. John Banks. But um, the, um, the, the other board is the Board of Governors, and uh, the landlords um, you know, would like to directly input their listings uh, into uh, the RLS. Um, and that's, you know, that's something that you know, um, is probably coming any, any minute now. So what, what, what will that mean for new development markets? Well, it's just that the landlords can list direct. So the landlords are going to have more than one, and they already have way, many other ways to get the word out that they're listing their property. So the landlords, um, I think, are uh, as big a competitor of the rental broker um, than, um, than StreetEasy is. I think the landlords are even a bigger uh, competitor uh, in, that, in that space. So you've been doing this now for 30 years or 25 years? I, I don't know. What? How, how long have you been doing it for? 22, 20 Too years? Long. All right. Well, how, what do you foresee the role of the real estate broker is going to be in three years from now? Well, um, I mean, I, I think the real estate broker um, is going to have to be extremely knowledgeable and, and really be value add. And, um, you know, there is, uh, there, you know, Manhattan, is a very, very large market to get your arms around. Um, there are uh, off-market uh, or to-be-listed opportunities that um, real estate brokers are aware of. Um, and somebody with a lot of skill and knowledge, like the Hamptons is a good example, in the high-end market, um, it's, you know, it's who do you know and what do you know about them and are they motivated to sell or not. And the really great pros out there, and I'm going to give someone a plug right now, but Susan Breitenbach, you know, knows every single house. She's a Cochran. She knows every single house. She knows who owned it. She knows the history of the house. She's been in every house. And you could meet with her and tell her all these things you're looking for, that you want to have a main house and a guest house, and you want to have a pool cottage, and you want to have a certain view. And it might not be on the market, but she's thinking in her head, you know, uh, you know, the Wilson house might be perfect for these people. So like the very knowledgeable brokers, there will still be great demand. But one thing that we notice with, at The Real Deal, we attract a number of uh, real estate licenses over the last couple of years and the number of transactions. And the number of real estate licenses actually went up in Manhattan mm -hmm. and the number of transactions came down, which means basically there's less of the pie for everybody and there's more people coming to eat the pie. Right, if, if the people that got their real estate licenses truly intend to be a full-time, 110% devoted uh, real estate professional, a lot of times people enter real estate through residential, through the real estate license, um, but that's not really what their end intention is. Their end intention might be property management. Their end intention might be construction. Their end intention might be architecture, management, et cetera, et cetera. And it could just be their, their point of entry. And now with all these different uh, options for the landlords and the developers, uh, do you see that uh, the percentage of commissions are going to keep getting reduced? What was the question? Well, so do you I heard the second part. What was the first part? Yes. With, with all these options for landlords and developers, do you foresee that uh, num the percentage of commissions is going to get reduced? Well, it's interesting. Um, on the landlord uh, developer side, um, there are some markets, um, and it really depends on, on, on how the market's doing that year and what the, what the demand is, if it's, if it's a demand side you know, or a supply side market. And, um, you know, in some markets, they're offering 6% uh, and 8% commissions and 10% commissions. Yeah. Where is that? So there's a development in Orlando um, that will offer you a 10% commission if you do a deal there. There's a development in Panama that will offer you a 10% commission to do a deal there. Plus, they will fly you and somebody else down there for three days to go look at the property for free if you're, you know, a bona fide, legitimate, uh, you know, tradesman. Um, in Miami, Florida, they offer 6%. Um, if you do transactions um, with the Chinese, somebody from the Chinese side that represents the buyers. What about New York City? Well, are the percentage uh, of commission, the rate of commissions, are they going to drop in New York City? There's, they're, they're trying to have the, uh, the commission drop, but it also depends on um, if, if people are getting the price that they want 
for their apartment. Um, so, I mean, is the commission lower now than it was before? You know, did you get, do you get 6% on $20 million properties now versus 5%? I would lean towards saying no, you probably get 5% uh, gross. You know, or even less. Um, you had a unique experience when you went out to the outer boroughs. You went to Brooklyn and Queens, I believe. Uh, that one time. <laughs> that, that one time that you got lost and went there. But uh, what, you, you had an interesting take on having an office in the outer boroughs and how the commissions work and how the developers work out there. Can you share that with everyone? Yeah. So um, what I found, and um, we have we have some great and had some or had some great. Uh, Brooklyn brokers, brokers that live in Brooklyn and sell Brooklyn that work to town and, and others that live in Manhattan but trade in, trade in Brooklyn and, and really and live there or believe in it. Um, and uh, the rental fees out there um, are, are never more than a month and quite often um, like we would see deposits go in and I would see a deposit of like Five hundred and forty dollars, um, and I didn't understand what that what it was. And this was unique to the outer boroughs. Um, yeah, unique. Well, this this happened to have been out of my Queens office, um, and it just so happens that the commission, the total commission for one landlord that has a bunch of properties out there, is a half a month, and then it was split with somebody a quarter month and a quarter month. Um, so not only is there very little volume out there. But there is also uh, very little uh, gross revenues. You know, they say when the shit hits the fan, you find out who your friends are. Yeah. Who did you, uh, did you, how, what was the response from the other brokerage heads and how did they react when they, you know, I'm sure they all reached out to you. So what was that like? Right. So um, I was in close contact uh, with Pam Liebman and uh, she was very, uh, very gracious. Uh, granted, she was, um, uh, wooing and, and, and attracting some of the best brokers of town. Um, but, uh, you know, her and I, uh, I think, are, are good friends and still still will be. Um, and uh, I just saw Diane Ramirez earlier, who just gave me a big hug and kiss. Um, so that's uh, two people so far that, uh, that reached out. <laughs> I don't know if Fred Peters is here. Um, hi, Fred. <laughs> we spoke on LinkedIn this morning. Fred sent me an email today saying, if uh, I, uh, you know, if I burn my company down to the ground, will you have me on stage for a one-on-one -on -one too? Yeah. <laughs> so. Burn the company to the ground. So, so Andrew, I get a lot of people, you know, we asked a lot of people what we should ask you. And uh, like one of the first things that came up that was unanimous was everybody wants to know what you're going to do next. So what is the next act for Andrew Heiberger? So <clears throat> I don't really have uh, a business plan for what's next. Um, I do uh, want to reiterate, and I want to put this out in space, that um, I do not think that uh, the town residential brand um, deserves to have a toe tag. So I would just leave it at that um, in rental and sales. Um, as far as new development is concerned, and I spoke with um, one of my largest uh, clients this morning uh, who's on board with me and with Town New Development. Um, you know, the, the two prominent new developments that we have right now um, are still there. Uh, granted, um, they've had their own uh, stalls uh, for various reasons. Um, one of them is 525th Avenue where um, um, the CEO, Lou Ceruzzi, passed away. And um, the other is on 47th Street, um, which has you know, kind of been in pause mode. But I personally uh, worked on both of those new developments from start to finish, worked on all the pre-development. I did all the floor plans and the programming and everything along those lines. And as long as I don't have a toe tag, um, those projects can get completed by me. So do you trust that uh, developers will still uh, have confidence in you to give their projects to you for, for you to sell it for them? Um, in, in, in me, yes. I think that uh, actually, well, in town, in town. Well, um, the two projects that are with town new development are those two projects I just mentioned. And whether or not town new development continues forward as town new development, whether or not Andrew Heiberger continues forward as 
uh, a new development consultant or a GP or a developer, um, or whether or not Andrew Heiberger um, proceeds forward under Buttonwood development. So, so basically you're saying you're going to have the role it's, of a consultant. Still, still being sorted out. A new development, sort of a marketing firm. That's, is, that, is that the next act? Uh, I, I don't have a next act. Um, that is one aspect um, of the business that um, I think can be very prof profitable over time. And, um, and you have to just be very, very careful about your assignments and, and about the economic terms. If you have a message for all the brokers out there, what would it be? Uh, the message would be um, to uh, make yourself as expert as you can um, in the product. Um, product knowledge trumps everything. And I think that uh, you need to just constantly, constantly be looking at new product every single day. Um, the number one broker at town, uh, Danny Davis, um, that's what he does all day long in between appointments. When he's out in the field, he rides his bike up, he gets off, and he looks at new product as the listings come on. And he be, he's a true expert and a true technician. So I think that product knowledge uh, is the number one most important. Well, Andrew, I, I want to tell you that it takes a lot of balls to come here roughly about three weeks after everything happened and sort of address all this stuff and talk about all this stuff. So I really want to thank you for coming here. It's very gracious of you. And I want to thank everybody who showed up here tonight. Thank you. Thank you.